I'm going to explain how the Mission AR demo works uh, programmatically and how its setup works and things like that. Uh, this was a demo that Microsoft and Epic Games showed at one or various conferences. It's one of the it's one of the demos for the HoloLens 2 that shows up when you look up HoloLens 2 Unreal on YouTube. Uh, you can find it on the Unreal Marketplace for free. Just search Mission AR, and it's this one. Um, I've already created a project, but you can create a project and use one of these two engine versions, and it should work fine. Um, I've already done that, so it gives me uh, a folder like this. And you can double click the U projects or open it in whatever Unreal version you're using. I think I'm using 4.24. Yeah, I am. And at first, you will get something like this. Not with this, though. So by default, you'll see something like this. Uh, before I start, I should mention that uh, I... So my goal was to just document their code. For example, all these blue documentation uh, snippets are mine, and the, anything that's not blue is theirs. Uh, so my goal was to document their stuff that they didn't explain well, so that you could understand how the blueprint the blueprints relate to each other. Um, it's not the most intuitive thing in the world, and uh, they're using they're using some techniques that you may not be super familiar with unless you programmed a lot in like a software development comp uh, context. So I'll be explaining my comments for these things. I didn't actually change any of the code for the most part. I think the only things that I added were these debug spheres, which show you where the controllers are. Um, and the HoloLens 2 doesn't use controllers. Um, you would see the spheres around the hands instead. But I'll explain why these controllers are, I'm calling them controllers uh, in a second. Uh, and the, yeah, there are a lot of blueprints, and they're all in this Mission AR folder, and it looks like there's a lot of stuff, but a lot of the blueprints are just not doing anything, or they're being used for some kind of animation. Uh, and this is a pretty common technique of just using a blueprint that doesn't have any code in it for the sake of saving information about the structure of something. Uh, it helps because then you don't need to spawn an empty actor and then add all the components. So. Uh, it just looks more intimidating than it is. There actually isn't that much code, and a lot of the code that they are using is repeated in a lot of ways, which we'll see uh, soon enough. Uh, what else? I don't actually have my HoloLens 2 with me. I give it back to the lab for it to be used for another project, but you can actually simulate this in VR if you have a VR headset. So in plugins, you can go to VR and enable whatever headset you're using, like I'm using a Vive Pro because I use it for my research. Uh, so I enabled Steam VR. If you're using an Oculus or something, you can use Oculus VR. Um, it doesn't really matter. It's uh, you just need a VR headset that has controllers, um, and it should be tethered. Uh, if you try to build and run this project on the Oculus Quest, it simply won't run. Uh, the requirements are too high. So I did that, and then you can use the Play and VR button to simulate it as if you were in AR, except in AR, instead of seeing all this black, you would see the real world, because anything black in the HoloLens is rendered transparent. So uh, the, the first level that shows up is this P anchor setup. Actually, what I'll do first is show you what the entire demo looks like so that you get a sense of uh, which parts are important or not. Um, I'll explain as the demo is running. And note that it has a terrible frame rate. Uh, you'll you'll you sh you'll probably notice this in the recording. The frame rate is like 15 FPS most of the time, and I suspect that they're using some ray tracing somewhere. Um, I don't I didn't really investigate this too much because I was worried about the code, but if that bothers you, uh, keep that in mind. There's some way to optimize the graphics so it doesn't run like garbage. But anyway. I'll play through the demo, uh, switch my mic to the Vive one. So, first, see um, this little icon that tells you to put the marker on a tabletop. The marker is over there. And normally, um, 
a couple of things. Normally, I think the headset of the Hubble lens is centered better. Um, like notice that it crops this icon here. It's because um, in the if I were in the Hubble lens, my head would have spawned down there because the tracking origin is different. Um, but anyway, that is the marker over there. And I found that the most consistent way to get it to move somewhere in VR is to just put your hand near it. I just kind of like look in one place for a while. I got this to work before. In any case, it doesn't matter because uh, we don't have a real environment like a table to place it on, so it's not going to make a difference. But normally this will just place on your tabletop, like it says, your table or wherever you want to put it. Um, I'm not actually sure what that is. It's not being used inside the code anywhere. But that thing is supposed to move here. Um, and if it doesn't, it's fine. Because it's not being used for anything. I did get it to work before. Whatever, I won't worry about it. So, the hands. These would be your AR hands. Like in the HoloLens 2. Right now, they're, they're my Vive controllers. So, I will press this button. And then it will load the main level that does everything. So Press the glowing object to start the demo. You can't start it yet until this orange glow shows up. And I'll show you in the code where exactly that orange glow is being enabled and disabled. Here is... Ooh, I don't know why the rendering went black on my hands. The Saturn V rocket, created to make that dream possible, was the largest flying machine Here's ever built really and is still the most powerful rocket ever successfully launched. This text faces me all the time. The Saturn V was a three-stage rocket. Each stage had a part to play to make the journey from the Earth to the Moon possible. When you're ready to see how it all works, really touch the glowing base of the Saturn V to initiate the launch sequence. So, I have to crouch down to do this, but normally this is just being on the tabletop, so it wouldn't Ignition be that hard to reach. All engine running. Lift off. You can see how bad we the frame rate is, because I'm drawing Power the debug spheres at 15 FPS, I think. Yet, there's still ghosting, which means that this is running the first less stage than lifted Apollo 11's 6 million pound weight from the ground to a height of 62 miles before dropping away after its fuel was expended. Or, I mean, there's not that much ghost. The interstage ring so, provided a small amount of thrust to settle the fuel in the tank actually, so I'm that the stage two FPS, rockets could fire so and get the Saturn V into a low Earth if orbit. If I see three of these spheres, that means that it's running at 15 It also FPS, fell away when empty. But I normally only see two, so that means it's probably running at 10. Third stage 15. fired once to get Apollo 11 into a parking orbit around the Earth, and after so, a few hours for system checks, fired again to send it on its show way you to the, the launch moon. sequence. Ready to move on? Just press the glowing command module. This is that. Apollo 11, this is Houston. Uh, here, go for separate. Shortly after leaving the Earth orbit, the command and service modules separated from the now expended third stage and then turned around to extract the lunar module. The graphics are super high detail, so. I suspect that a lot of the lag is caused by just their extremely high vertex count. Now the Apollo spacecraft could continue on its journey, rotating slowly to spread the intense heat of the sun across the entire spacecraft in what was jokingly known as barbecue mode. It was in this configuration that it entered orbit around the moon almost three days and a quarter million miles later. The foil part looks really high detail too. Once in orbit, and the commander like, and lander pilot I don't know transferred it's to the lunar module and separated from the CSM to make their way to the lunar the surface. The, the this was the hardest and most here. dangerous part of the entire mission. And they're pretty high detail reflections. The lunar module Eagle was a strange looking machine. It consisted of an ascent and descent stage. Only the ascent stage was designed to return to the CSM on the completion of a successful mission. As the descent the stage code, would be left on the surface um, of the moon. Pretty much As the lunar module was designed to fly in the vacuum of space, there was no need for it to be aerodynamic. Weight was kept to an absolute minimum. The walls of the cabin were no thicker than a few sheets of aluminum foil. Hey, look. The astronauts didn't even have seats and piloted pictures. the ship standing upright in what was essentially a controlled fall from orbit. up to see the lunar module make its final descent. 
So change to the moon. There were computer errors as well as giant craters and huge boulders which had to be avoided in order to find a safe place to land. I was messing around with it earlier and this effect, this particle effect as here, they neared the moon's causes surface, a ton of dust blown by the engine loss. made judging the motion of the craft extremely difficult. They had done it, with less than a minute of fuel to spare. Shadows are really good. When too. you're ready to proceed, press the hatch on the eagle. Shadows wouldn't render well in AR though. Seven hours later, the commander made his way down the ladder to stand upon the foot of the lunar module. Okay, we can see you coming down the ladder now. So the combined 360-pound weight of the commander and his spacesuit was a mere 60 pounds in the one-sixth gravity of the moon, making we'll moon the moon extremely the astronaut easy. astronaut has its own uh, level sequence that controls his animation. The commander had to jump from the end of the ladder to Eagle's foot, as the landing was so the gentle the legs had not compressed as intended when they touched down. All that remained to do was for the commander to take one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, onto the surface of the moon. Any day now. That is footstep. <clears throat> this footprint represents the culmination of a decade's work by and almost 400,000 people in what was one of the greatest periods of discovery in human foot. history, and is still probably there to this day. Press the footprint when you are ready to end this demo and return to planet Earth. Apparently you just gave up on walking anymore. Just put one foot down and then back up to Earth. So yeah, then it shows you the name. And then it'll show you the logos of the companies. Or Collins, who's not a company, but whatever. And then it restarts. Press the glowing object to start the demo. So, um... That's the whole demo that we are going to look at the code for. I'm going to switch back to my uh, webcam mic. All right, I recorded 15 minutes worth of tutorial before realizing that I wasn't recording. So that was great. Uh, um, so I think I mentioned it in the first part that to simulate this on VR, you need to make sure that one of the VR APIs is set up in plugins. After that, you don't need to do anything else to get it to work. You can just play in VR and it'll work with the controllers. Um, I've always had problems with Unreal, uh, just not reading the VR headset if it's not turned on when the Unreal instance begins. So if you have that problem, you can uh, you know, make sure the VR headset is connected in Steam VR or Oculus and then reopen Unreal. But anyway, uh, moving on to the actual code in the AR game mode. So this This scene is what opens up first. This is the anchor setup where you would place a pin on your desk or something It would save it in the HoloLens uh, user data and then use it in future instances The scene is very simple. Two of these things don't even do anything. Uh, the anchor gizmo is basically just the visuals for this pin if you go into the blueprint, you'll see that it's actually not doing anything. Um, it's just used for uh, positioning the different things. But it's not really doing anything by itself. And the anchor marker is just used to... It's placed where the saved pin is actually located. And in the case of a VR simulation like this one, it won't place it anywhere because it can't save the pin. So that's what these two things do. The scripts that we do care about are the anchor setup, and the player. So I'll explain the player first because it's actually a lot simpler than you would expect. You can go to the game mode AR pawn. And the only all the code is the same. I didn't actually change anything except add comments, sometimes move the position of these nodes slightly, and I added debug spheres for the hands. Here I was just putting the level name because I was... Uh, I was troubleshooting that problem where if the player start is not in the right place, then you don't see anything, but you don't need this. Um, so I only added these debug spheres and all the other code is the same. 
what's happening here is in begin play, it's doing a bunch of collision detection or, or setup for the collision detection or visuals. So here it is turning the meshes and stuff invisible. Uh, if it does find fingers, like with the HoloLens hand tracking, then it creates these like cylinder meshes between the joints. So if you go into this function, you can see it's adding some static mesh components. And it either adds fingertips or fingers. The fingertips and the fingers are just these little cylinders. So if you open the skeletal mesh, or the, the static mesh, you'll see that this is all they are. So you kind of get these ugly fingers, but they would work, I guess. This is an even smaller uh, cylinder. But uh, really, it doesn't matter that much what they look like because the fingers are not being used for collision detection anyway. It's just using the sphere that's attached to your hand. You can go to the other tutorial that I made for uh, the tutorial on how to actually use the fingers for collision detection and how to render them better. Uh, so after it does that, it binds both it creates events for, well, the, the events are created, but it's binding some custom events to these embedded or these built-in functions that are called when the hands are seen or not seen. So this function here gets called when the HoloLens or Vive or whatever can't see the, the right controller. And this is called when it can see the controller. And these get called when it changes, uh, not constantly. So it's simple enough. When it's seen, you render the fingers. When it's not seen, you don't render them. And when the hand is not visible, what it does to make sure that it doesn't collide with the button on accident is it moves the motion control components uh, just really far away from the center of the level so that it can't possibly collide with the level or with the button or anything else that's important for this level. Uh, I think I mentioned, I don't remember if I mentioned this in the first part or not, but the reason that these motion controllers work in VR is because these are actually a subclass of the same motion controller that we use in VR. So if you open up AR motion controller, you'll notice that it's a subclass of this motion controller component, which is exactly the same one that we use for Vive controllers and stuff like that in Unreal. So you can see it still has motion source, player index, and stuff like that. And then they add more information like, uh, which of the AR hands it is and stuff like that. The internals of how the AR motion controller work are not really important in understanding the mission AR demo. So I'll leave this uh, for you to explore. But most of it is just rendering things in a certain way. So I guess it's not that important in understanding the functionality anyway. But moving on, the uh, it's doing the same thing for the left hand and that's pretty much the end of this part. It's creating all these callbacks for both hands and, you know, setting the fingers to be certain colors and stuff like that. Then what it's doing is it's just creating a variable for this game mode. As far as I can tell, it's not being used for anything, so I'm not sure why they're doing this. Maybe they planned on using it for something or maybe they were leaving some, they were leaving the potential for a multiplayer simulation because you would need the game mode to handle like where people spawn and stuff like that. But in any case, for now, it doesn't seem to be doing anything important. Then they have the input action skip, which is it's tied to the spacebar. So you can hit spacebar and it will skip to the next part of the simulation. Like you can skip the JFK talking section or I don't know, move to move from Earth to the moon very quickly or something like that. You can check the inputs that they've defined in project settings input project settings input and most of these things are just debugs debug related and this is spacebar and there's not really anything else happening here because everything else is collision based so that's all there is to ar pawn it's not very complicated almost all of the important stuff is happening when these spheres collide with another object in the scene in which case that object receives the collision on its end and it handles what's happening or whatever will happen when you touch that object which we'll see soon enough but this is ar pawn it's i don't think it's that complicated um 
or at the very least, that's the least complicated of the blueprints that we'll see. The other important one in this scene is anchor setup, which handles loading and creating pins. So in begin play, it creates an AR session, which won't do anything in the case of the VR simulation, as you saw with that error that showed up when I was simulating this in VR, or, yeah, in, in the Vive. Uh, but the AR session is kind of useful because it will let you configure whether or not it uses mesh data, uh, where things spawn, what the axes are relative to, and things like that. So it's useful in general for AR stuff. It's just not useful when you're simulating in VR. Then it enables input, which is pretty much only useful for the spacebar or those other debug related inputs. Whether or not the input is enabled doesn't really affect the collision detection or it doesn't affect it at all as far as I know. Uh, then it's saving the AR pawn as a variable. It is attaching itself to the camera. And by itself, I mean BP anchor setup is this diamond thing that you saw. So it attaches itself to the camera so that it's always in front of the camera, which you noticed during the demo. Um, it was always following the camera. And it snaps to the target, which means that uh, it'll appear right in front of your camera. I think it's offset by a little bit. So the roots. It's, yeah, it's, hmm. Is it offset? Oh, it is. This is local axes. So it's pushed to be um, 60 centimeters in front of your face. But moving on. Uh, then it sets this uh, AR pin to be null at first. Then it tries to grab the saved pins from the headset, the Windows Mixed Reality headset, probably the HoloLens. In the case of simulating in VR, this will just fail because it can't do that because the Vive is not a mixed reality headset. But if it can, if it does find stuff, it will go through this for each loop, look for something with whatever uh, string is assigned to this variable, in this case, just AR pin. And if it finds this something of this exact name, then it will use that for all future versions of this or future runs of this app. Um, otherwise, it'll create one. So it will try to assign, if, if such a pin exists, it will try to assign it to this variable. Um, if a pin doesn't exist, then it'll move on anyway. So is valid. This will It'll go through this path when it does find that pin. And it handles loading them. And it also waits for the anchor to actually be seen. So for example, if you have saved information about this pin. Like let's say that in a previous session you saved uh, where the pin is located, like on your desk. Uh, this, the, the event tick, we'll look at event tick in a second, but event tick is waiting to find that pin. It's waiting for you to look at the table, in which case it'll be like, oh, there's that pin. And then it will uh, move everything there. Um, otherwise it just doesn't bother. It just, it'll just create a new one. So, uh, the last thing that it's doing is grabbing the anchor marker, which, like I say here, is only for visuals. The anchor marker is this tall thing, which they'll place at a pin if they find that pin and can save it. So, um, I'll look at teleport in a second. The order of their blueprints, like where things are located spatially, is a little bit weird because it's not actually in the order that it's called. So that can make this a little bit hard to read. For example, end play should probably be lower. But end play is simple enough because they're just stopping the AR session. Not really sure why they need to do this because they're not really opening a file or anything like that. So it doesn't seem necessary, but maybe it's something you need to do for their API or maybe it's force of habit. Who knows? So I'll look at teleport in a second. Uh, next I'll show, oh, C is used to restart this whole calibration process. So that's simple enough. In event tick, they are doing a couple of things. First, they, what they're doing first is active, act, active becomes true when they 
when the pin is not saved. So notice active set to true when they cannot find the pin. So if they can't find the pin, then they raycast forward and they use that to try to find a place for you to put the pin. They're using the arrow of the anchor setup itself. So this big red arrow, which you wouldn't see in the game. I'm not sure, and also because the anchor setup is attached to the camera, this is actually pointing in the camera's forward vector. I'm not sure why they decided to use the arrow instead of simply the forward vector, but that's how they're doing it. So they line trace, starting from the arrow location, and ending five meters in the forward direction. So it's raycast it's raycasting about five meters in front of the arrow, which should be five meters, five point six meters in front of the camera itself. Because the arrow is located six meters in front of the or six sixty centimeters in front of the camera. So they're raycasting that direction. If they find something and you have uh, show debug point to true, then it'll draw a little yellow uh, point there. Otherwise, it will set the location of the gizmo to be the location that you were looking. And the gizmo would be this thing, the thing that's blinking. I couldn't get that to work when I was demoing it before, but if you were in the HoloLens or something, where the environmental mesh can actually be used, then it would have worked. I have gotten it work in the, I've gotten it to work in the Vibe before, but I think I was much closer to the ground maybe, so it was colliding with the ground plane or something weird like that. I don't remember. But this is how this is working. Um, if there, if the pin has been found, then it doesn't bother because obviously it already has that pin saved, so they don't need to try to find a new location. Then what they're doing is putting, basically if they can, so handling load I think was set to true when they did find a pin. So this is set to true here when they actually find the pin. If they do find the pin, then they just teleport you to that location and start the game because they don't need you to create a new pin. It'll just do it. So once they find it, then they will start the next part. Uh, they're using this enum, which is built in. So here is the pin that they know is saved, like on your table or something, if you've run the session before. They're testing whether or not it's being tracked. And if so, so if the tracking state is the current state, then they teleport you into the game. Otherwise they don't do anything. They just print some debug information. And this part here is basically just putting the anchor marker, this long cone thing, at the location of the saved uh, the saved pin. But as far as I know, it, uh, the anchor marker is not being used for anything else throughout the simulation. It's just being placed where the pin is. So I'm not really sure if it's meant to be useful for anything, but it doesn't appear to be. So anyway, in both cases, you will be teleported eventually, or this teleport function up here is called, uh, regardless of whether you have a pin saved or not. And the teleport the teleport function is what will eventually, eventually transfer you to the real level. So teleport is called and it can get called Oh, sorry, um, I skipped the overlap part. Let's look at overlap. Uh, this overlap function is called if your hand touches the box, the box being around the anchor setup here. And they're not checking to make sure that the other actor is in fact your pawn, because in this scene, there is nothing else that can collide with this. But in later scenes, you'll see that they actually do check that. So. This, this, the rest of this code doesn't run unless active is true. Active can only become true if they find a pin. Uh, yeah, if they find, actually no. If they don't, if they do find a pin, then they just immediately send you to teleport. 
Otherwise, they'll set active to true. So this, this overlap script basically only happens when they don't find a pin. Uh, so active will be true. They'll play some sound when you touch the box. It'll create a little animation. I don't remember exactly what the animation looked like. I think it turned blue or something. Uh, you can find it in the video before this session. And then what it's doing is uh, deleting pins that it doesn't need, I guess. It seems, I remember seeing somewhere that you need to be careful with this because uh, it can delete a bunch of other pins from other applications, maybe. Because it kind of just deletes every other pin. I'm not sure if this function, where in the world am I? I'm not sure if this function for deleting pins only deletes pins that are relevant to the simulation or just all of them that are saved on the HoloLens. If it's all of the HoloLens pins, then that's probably not the safest thing, but that's what it's doing. Uh, then it creates the pin and it, it creates a pin object and then it saves it to the HoloLens or Windows Mixed Reality headsets user data. And then it calls teleport so that it can teleport you to the actual level. And afterwards, it's just printing the transform. Um, they left a lot of debug stuff in here. So now we can look at teleport. Um, I jumped the gun before. So now we've seen that in both cases, it teleports. Um, if you don't have a pin saved, it'll go through the overlap loop and then call teleport. If there is a pin saved, it waits until it can find the pin in the real world. And once it does, then it will teleport you. So the end goal is this teleport function. Uh, I wrote call an overlap. It should actually be called called an overlap or when save pin found. By the way, if uh, if I miss something, you can pause the video at any point and look at the comments. All of my comments are blue. So in teleport, they wait 0.1 seconds. I'm not sure why they do this, but they do. Maybe they're waiting for the pin to be saved. Uh, but anyway, they do this, then they teleport. They teleport the player to the pin. And then, uh, then they basically do a bunch of setup or they do more like a set down. I don't know if they're, they're resetting a bunch of stuff so they can move on to the next level. So they stop AR session again. I don't know why they do this. Then they start the same AR session again. Not sure why they do that. Um, based on what I'm seeing here, it looks like in this case, they're using no mesh. So they're not using the environmental mesh, probably as an, uh, as an optimization of some type. But up here, they are using the mesh. So this, if you look at the text that's showing up on the tooltip, you'll see that this doesn't say no mesh, which means it is using the mesh. So I guess that's why they do that. Uh, they destroy the BP gizmo because that's the blinking thing that's only used for visuals, that thing over there. Then they are hiding the player's pawn. Oh no, no they're not hiding the pawn. They're not uh, hiding the pawn, they're hiding this diamond thing. Then they are making the anchor marker invisible. Still don't know. Still don't know why they actually need this at all. Then they fade the camera, and they put in some kind of synthetic delay so that it waits until approximately when the fade would stop. And then they load the next level. Notice that they're not just calling open level like you would do normally. They are doing load stream level. I'm not sure why they decided to stream it instead. Uh, maybe it was because they didn't want to use a singleton or something like that to transfer the pin location and stuff like that. Um, it was probably easier to just load the level in instead of dealing with all of that stuff being transferred. But most of the magic is happening in this level. And it loads it, and that's pretty much the end of this anchor setup scene. So... Now we will check out this level and see what's happening here because this is the more complex one. But uh, these are the two scripts that matter for anchor setup. So hopefully my comments help you. Um, I'll kind of just uh, scroll through so that if you want to, you can read my comments. 
and pause on a or pause on a frame and read my comments in case I miss something. So here is begin play. Here is the end session and teleport. Here is overlap. I don't really have any other comments in there. Here is tick. I have one comment here. And then their other comments are fine. So yeah, that's it for the scene. I will move on. So uh, you can you can filter by level or you can just search for the scene. I'm going to filter by level because it's easier. So LAR interaction is the better scene. Oh, uh, one more thing about the anchor setup scene. I don't remember if I mentioned it in the first part or not. So <clears throat> normally with the HoloLens, when you first open the app, it puts the headset at like 0, 0, 0, and then it offsets it based on height. But it means that you don't usually need a player start in AR because you can assume that the camera or the headset will spawn at X and Y being 0, um, and the forward vector being whatever vector you were looking in. Or I guess positive X, so this axis will just be whatever direction you were looking in when the app started on the HoloLens. Um, in VR, it's different because they didn't actually have this player start. I added this. In VR, uh, they don't have a player start, so it says spawn player at current camera location. So if you start the game when you're looking back here, uh, you won't see anything because this is outside of the level. So everything will just be rendered black, and uh, that confused me for a second because I didn't know what was happening. But yeah. I fixed that by just throwing a player start in here. Simple enough. It doesn't really affect anything else. It's just to make sure that when you do spawn, you spawn in the center. And uh, in a location where you can see everything else and it doesn't get completely cut off. So let's move on to LAR interaction. The scene is crazy slow. I think I mentioned in the first part of this video that I thought it was because of ray tracing, but on further investigation, what I find is that the static meshes are just crazy high uh, tessellated, uh, tessellation. So this thing here, this is a simplified version of the of this mesh. But if you look at most of the other meshes, like all these arms, they're almost a hundred thousand vertices each just for these blue arm things. And then if you look at other things like the astronaut, those are a couple hundred thousand vertices each. So uh, where's that astronaut? Here he is. 250,000 vertices just for the astronaut guy. And there were two of them and all of the other parts. So if you look at other parts, the engines are actually not that high res, but this is 77,000, this is 126,000. So you can see ton of vertices, so it just destroys my GPU, which is a GTX 1080. So um, you want to be wary of that. And that's that again supports the notion that this wouldn't run on a mobile device. I don't think they're... Yeah, it looks like they're not even using a level of detail. They just have the highest resolution mesh. Yeah, so keep that in mind. Ton of vertices in the scene, and so it runs terribly if you don't have enough video RAM. So moving on, this level is interesting because pretty much all of the rest of the simulation is happening in this one level. It seems like there are a lot of levels in here, but most of them are being streamed into this level or just not doing anything. Like starter map is the basic Unreal starter map that has all the different materials in it. So yeah, the meat of the demo is P anchor setup and L AR interaction. So I will show you what's happening here. It seems like there are a lot of blueprints here, but most of them are actually not doing anything as far as programming goes. Uh, once again, they're either just 
being operated on by another blueprint or just being used for animation and setup like uh, the earth and things like that which are pretty much just being used in the level sequencer and as for the things that actually are doing stuff these are the AR interactive objects so these are all of the like steps of the demo and inside the code as we'll see what they're doing is just kind of swapping between these different things so the Apollo logo was the very first thing that showed up then and you can also verify this by looking at the exposed variables here uh, like for example actor to trigger is what we care about and actor to trigger will tell you what the next thing that is supposed to load is so Apollo logo is the first thing that loads it has its first checkbox and then it loads the rocket with launch pad, which is uh, when it's still on Earth. Then this thing is going to load the landing. And then this will load the names, which uh, were the two names of the company. Or the Unreal Engine and then HoloLens 2 logos. And then this will load the end logo, which is... Um, I don't remember what the end logo was actually. Oh, sorry. Name name logo I think was the Apollo name. Yeah, this, that's this part. Then that loads the end logo, which are the two logos on Real and Hololens two, and then end logo will load reset, and then reset will go back in a circle and load the Apollo logo again to restart the simulation. So. We'll look at these in order, in order. My brain is breaking today. But these are this is where the meat of the code is, and they're kind of just swapping between these things. Like, if you disable all of the AR interactive objects except for the Apollo logo, this will just be like the beginning of the simulation, except for the spinning light. But uh, you know, this will be the beginning of the simulation. And then if I disable Apollo logo and go to Launchpad, this will be the next part of the simulation, and so on. So we'll look at these one at a time. And once again, I have a lot of uh, comments. Oh god, I was really worried that I wasn't recording. All right, so here is the Apollo logo. And what you'll notice uh, in all of these blueprint classes is that they are either overriding functions from the parents or they're just using the parents version of the function in particular the functions that handle when the the interactive part is overlapped with and the fading so when it moves on to the next step all of these objects have or all of these steps i should say have this thing called ar interactive overlap and this defines the area that the player is supposed to touch. So with the launch pad, I touch the launch pad itself. With Apollo logo, I touch the start button and so on. With, uh, with the landing, I touched the astronaut, or I touched the door of the thing and then the footprint. So all of these have that in common and they all have an audio source. So back to the Apollo. Uh, this is another example of a piece of code that is not in order. So we'll start with begin play. I'm not sure why they didn't just begin overlap because it's not doing anything. So in begin play, um, they're just creating some visuals. Uh, in this case, I think that this is what creates the Kind of like oscillating blue color. I think that was there. I don't know. It's creating some kind of visuals and uh, setting distances and things like that. So this is setting the relative location of the overlap box to be farther from something. I guess it's just pushing it away from the user. I didn't really dig into this because it's just visual related. 
the important stuff is happening with the other code. So the Apollo script is calling the parent begin play as well as this border thing. So in the parent begin play, it's doing all the setup and creating some callbacks. So what it does first is create or assign the pawn variable to the actual pawn. Is, if is first is true, which is the case for the Apollo logo, because it's the first part of that sequence, then it will set itself to be the thing that the player interacts with. And then it does some more stuff, like it creates this callback function to be called when the audio source stops playing. The audio source being um, the one that tells you touch the glowing part. And uh, well, I'll move on before I talk about this part, but it's doing some stuff with custom depth. And um, what you'll notice is that anytime that it's playing with custom depth, they're changing the orange glow. So in this case, they are actually disabling it because they're setting post process to be off. Set my comments to be blue. They are disabling post process so that the, glow, the orange glow doesn't show up. And then they're making the oscillating uh, highlight thing happen. Now, something that might be confusing about this audio finished uh, function is that it doesn't seem to be doing anything. Um, but this is actually being overridden in the child, which is Apollo logo. So Apollo logo has its own FN audio finished. I'll go over the uh, FN audio finished function in a little bit, but this happens first. So after it fades from the previous scene or a reset, I guess, the previous scene being the anchor setup scene, it'll do uh, this. So forward, forward, their names, their naming conventions were not great in this demo, but forward basically says whether or not it's, whether the animation is playing forwards or backwards. Um, it'll make more sense in a little bit, but let's assume for now that forward is true, which is the case when it's fading from the previous scene. So it'll go through the true branch and it will disable the orange glow initially. So the orange outline that shows when something is interactive and then it will wait 0.2 seconds and then it will play the audio clip, which in this case is set to be the one that says, um, please touch the button. So here this script or uh, this audio source. Press the glowing object to start the demo. Yeah, that one. Uh, and yeah, so once this is done playing, it'll jump to FN Audio Finished. So what FN Audio Finished is doing here is setting, tr uh, setting the icon to be triggerable by enabling this so that inside of the parent's overlap script, um, it can move on. Then it is enabling the orange highlight. If you remember from the uh, demo in VR, the orange highlight doesn't happen until he's done talking, but it does some stuff with custom depth to uh, make it orange. You can find other tutorials on YouTube explaining how you highlight things on Unreal and it'll make more sense, but there's basically some kind of layer that you set in the post-process volume that handles this. Then it is making this noise, uh, this noise for when you can interact with something. It's like a bloop noise or something. I don't actually remember. Then it's setting in the parent. There's this function that says what the next thing that the user can interact with is. In this case, it's setting itself to be that thing. And then it's creating this timer. And what this timer is doing is <clears throat> waiting some amount of time before replaying the audio cue. So in this case, it's waiting this amount of time, five seconds before it calls this function here, loop sound, which corresponds to this event and it plays the audio cue. So if the user is not paying attention or something, or maybe they're just looking around or something like that, then uh, it'll replay the audio source for them so that they know what to do. 
even though in this demo it's simple enough that what to do is pretty self-explanatory, but who knows? Demos are always interesting. So that's what that's doing. Moving on. Uh, I already explained that part. So these other functions that are doing a lot of the work as far as interaction goes are inside of the parents, which I think I mentioned before. Uh, in particular, it's uh, Apollo logo is relying on the parents begin overlap. So now, as we saw inside of FN audio interaction or FN audio finished, they set can be triggered to be true. So now it'll go through this path, which it basically handles once it, it handles when the button is touched. So this is just this event that's directly below it. And it does a couple of things like it plays the sound for when you touch something. And then it calls this function, which can be used inside of the child to handle what you do when it is, when it is actually touched. And there's this other function that's doing basically the same thing. I'm not sure why they split up the functions like this, but they did. Inside of the parent, they're not doing anything, but they're being overridden in the child. So that's the case for early touch as well. I guess here's their comments. So I guess early touch is only used for the first interactive actor, which is Apollo logo. I still don't know why they had to split it like that though, considering they already have a variable for is first, but whatever. So the first thing that gets called in the parents is this because this is, this is a sequence here so interact start is the first thing that gets called it is overriding this here and what this is doing is again setting it's it's setting the next thing that you'll interact with to be nothing for now i suppose even though it's going to move on to the launch pad in a second it is about to fade away from this Apollo logo and making itself not be triggered so that the user can't accidentally press it again. So, events accidental touch. Then it's doing another sequence. What it does first is stop the audio from playing. This audio being that cue that says, please touch the glowing part. And then it's invalidating the timer, which is making sure that that loop is not ongoing. So it doesn't keep repeating this audio cue over and over again, even when you've already touched the logo. Then the second part is disabling that orange glow by again, playing with the custom depth. And finally it is fading. And this fade, uh, it's handled in the parents, but part of it will jump back into the child which is a little bit confusing, but that's how it works. So what this is doing is it's handling some play rate stuff, like for a animation, like fading. Then it's doing fading on a timeline and playing with more material parameters. But the most important part of this is that it will call fade done, which again, doesn't seem like it's doing anything in the parent, but it's being overridden in the child. So after fade is done, it'll call fade done. And this time, if you noticed, forward, let me, uh, you see, fade done, the direction, I don't remember where the direction is being set, but in this case, fade, I think will go backwards. Or I mean, it will go backward, backwards, I already know that. In is set to false. So if this is false, it will set the fade. Ah, oh, okay, here. So when in is false, which it is in the case of touching the button, then it will go down here to this path, which is calling reverse, which will cause the direction to be reversed. And so this will end up being backwards, which will mean that fn fade done's parameter will be false. And so up here in fn fade done, this will go through the false path, which does switch light. Um, switch light is basically changing which lights are visible at any given time. 
um, because they have these lights that are meant to glow at certain points. Um, seems like a really strange way of playing with lighting, but whatever. That's how they're doing it. They're just turning on and off lights. And then they trigger the next thing. Uh, the next thing being the launch pad. So um, if you're wondering what this is, uh, this, it's being called in the parents and it's calling on the actor to trigger this function. And if you recall, the actor to trigger is being set in the editor itself. So Apollo Logos actor to trigger is Rocket with Launchpad. So inside of Lock Rocket with Launchpad, this function will get called. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, there is a lot of other code that is unexplained for now. Um, in particular, uh, this part of the code, like the reset, but we'll get back to that. Um, the reset doesn't actually happen until it redoes the entire simulation, um, like after it's all done and it restarts at the Apollo logo. So uh, that's it for uh, Apollo logo. Now we can move on to Launchpad. We're going to continue out this function. So Launchpad is here. By the way, I, I'm going to keep everything just not just invisible so that it doesn't destroy my frame rate. All right. So uh, the launch pad is probably the most complicated of these scripts. So let us start by finding this. So here, BPI asked to trigger is what is being called by the Apollo logo. And what this is doing is, uh, I was actually I was thinking about something else, but uh, what this is doing is first playing the JFK video and then binding an event to when the video is done playing. So when the video is done playing, it will go down here to this function and then do this stuff. So it'll handle fading away the video and stuff like that. And remember that fade goes through this whole process and eventually calls the FN fade done, which again is being overridden. So here is the override of FN fade done. What this is doing is, again, it has forward or backwards. We're going to assume that forward always happens first because that is how it works. So forward will be true the first time that this gets called and it'll move on to here. Uh, JFK playlist can be set to true or false. If it's false, it just skips the video. So um, in this branch, um, it's handling, it's based on whether or not the video is playing. I'm just gonna assume the video is playing, so it'll go through true. And then it's doing a couple of stuff, a couple of things. It is moving some UI stuff around. Um, UI, UI parent class, Basically anything of UI parent class is like a 2D element. So for example, those steps, those little pieces of text that were facing you at all times, those are all UI parent or subclasses or children or instantiated children of BP UI parent. Uh, so it's just moving these things around um, and initializing them and stuff like that. Um, you can look through the details of this script, but really all they're doing is playing with material parameters and deciding where to play sounds and, you know, like how fast to play animations and things like that. It's not really important to understand this part if you're just trying to understand how the system is working. So I'm not really going to bother with explaining it because I think if you, I mean, if you look at it step by step, it's pretty obvious what this is doing. There aren't a whole lot of tricks here. It's just playing with dynamic materials and audio sources and stuff like that. So I'm not going to focus too much on this. Uh, so after it plays around with these UI things, what it will do is play the audio source. I don't remember exactly what sound height is. Uh, it's another audio cue. That it's, it's one of the main audio cues, so it's this next one. The Saturn V rocket created to make that dream possible was the largest fly. So yeah, that one. That might end up being really loud in the recording. 
I'll turn my desktop audio down. But anyway, it'll play that. And once again, it's binding an event to when that audio is finished playing, which will be this. So once the audio is done playing, it'll call finished height sound. Then it will do a small delay. I'm not sure why the delay is necessary. It might not be necessary, it might just be stylistic. But then it will play the audio source again, sound stages. So uh, somewhere I'm assuming they are changing. Oh wait, this is sound stages, sorry. Um, I thought it was sound height. Uh, yeah, so sound stages is definitely a different audio cue entirely. Uh, you can check out which one it is up here. So this is number three. It's saying that the rocket has three stages or whatever that cue was. Then it's playing that. Once again, it's creating a callback for when it's done. It is stopping the UI elements from following you. Or at least the previous ones, and then it's starting some new ones. Again, these are just all UI elements, animations, and things like that. So they're not really that important important to understand. I mean, the UI elements are basically always just facing you and they have their initialization code. But I think the UI stuff is simple enough. Uh, where was I? Here I was. All right, so um, this is just removing the previous UI elements and starting new ones. Anyway, when the audio source is finished playing, It'll call this, and again, they're delaying, playing another audio source. Um, I don't even know where this is. Uh, it's this one. So number four, when you're ready. So this is the one that that tells you to touch the base and to, uh, to move on to the next step. So it plays that. And then it creates another one of these timers that will repeat it every few seconds. In this case, it's 15 seconds. And when it does, it'll call this function, which is this one, which will play the audio source. So they pretty much use this exact same code multiple times throughout the simulation. I mean, it's their standard repeating code. So um, the reason that they waited to use this audio the one that was inherited uh, for the last step was because when this one finishes playing, it'll call the standard uh, callback function for when audio is finished that was defined in the parent. Uh, and this will do these things. It will it'll allow the thing to be triggerable, triggerable again. So it'll make it so that you can touch the launch pad which is this uh, yellow box that you see here. God, trying to navigate with terrible frame rate is awful. So AR interactive overlap is this box right here. So it is allowing you to trigger this. Again, it's enabling the glow effect by playing with custom depth. It's playing the, you can interact with it now cue. And then it's setting itself to be the thing that you can interact with at this point. Set next is probably not like the best naming convention. So, uh, once again, um, it'll pro the if you actually do touch this AR interactive overlap box, it will go through the parent. So remember that the parent is going to call. If you touch the box, this gets called. Can be trigger is now true, so it'll go into CE touched. It'll go through all of this and call interact start and early touch. And remember that early touch is only used for the first interactive actor, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, <clears throat> AR interact start, though, has been overridden inside the child. So in the child, what's happening is it is first stopping the audio source and then making sure it doesn't loop again. Then it's stopping the UI from showing. So if you recall, the UI elements that were showing at this point were the three stages. I think these are actually defined somewhere. UI list here. So 
they assign these inside of the exposed parameters. UI list has three elements, stage one, two, three. I know they're invisible, I think, so I can't see them. Hmm. I guess they need to be animated to actually show up. It's not important how exactly they're animated. Uh, where was I? Yeah, so it's stopping the UI from doing whatever it's doing. It'll just make them disappear, I guess. Or they just won't stop moving. And... with the stop you'll see that it hides them and it's doing some more uh, like material animation kind of stuff and playing some audio cues and then it's disabling the post process which will disable that orange glow then it plays the level sequence now the or movie sequence I guess it's called now and this will this is basically the sequence that will go through the entire launch process and I'll show you that in a second then it is binding an event to when it when the sequence is done so this this thing here is saving the sequence we'll see this in a second and it's disabling custom depth which is just another part of disabling the orange glow I'm not sure why they split it up um, it doesn't seem necessary. Uh, then they are changing. They call some delay and then they change the floor. Uh, swap floor changes between earth and moon floors. So, yeah. Uh, before I move on, I will show you how you can see where the movie sequence is. So, this is calling the sequencer launch. Or whatever is saved in sequencer launch. So, sequencer launches here. And you can double click this, or double click this, I mean, open level sequence, or you can double click that part. And this popped up. Uh, where should I put this? Put this here, I guess. Seems like a good place for a timeline. Um, but you can actually scroll through the timeline and see the part that's animating. So, I'm going to delete the Apollo. And you can scroll through the timeline and see the entire animation. And so, this is what they're waiting on. You can hear it's also playing audio cues at certain times. Um, I'm, not, I'm not the most familiar with Unreal's animation system. At least I'm not good at using it. So, if you want more information about how the movie making tools actually work, I recommend looking at another tutorial because it, I mean you can see that they put a lot of effort into making the animation look good so it's more about uh like once you understand the movie making basics it starts becoming a matter of how much effort you put into the animation but anyway they're waiting for it to end so the animation will stop at this point and then it will call launch stopped and when launch is, or when this is done, it plays uh, this audio cue. I don't remember what this audio cue is saying. All right, it's just an explosion. So it plays that, um, then it delays and then it plays another audio cue that probably it says ready to move on so this is ready to move on just this, press the glowing command oh god that's so loud uh this is the prompt that tells you that you should press the i don't remember what you press you press the tip of the rocket i think so it plays this audio and then there's a callback function that will get called afterwards after it's done playing, but 
First, uh, you could see that it's creating another one of these timers and callback functions to make sure that it loops at a certain frequency. Again, 15 seconds. So back to this callback, you can see what this is doing is allowing this capsule to have overlap events. This capsule being um, the tip right here. So it allows the tip to have overlap events, which allows it to, it allows the parent to handle touching it. Oh, this is the UI class. Um, it allows the parents wherever that went. Did the level change tabs? I think the level changed tabs from over here to here. It's weird. Anyway, by enabling overlap events, uh, when you touch the cylinder, or the capsule, it will go through this process. <clears throat> so it's doing that, it's re-enabling the orange glow, again with some depth uh, magic. It's playing the, you can interact with it now, uh, cue, the like booping noise, whatever it makes. And then it's setting itself to be the thing that the user can interact with now. And then, uh, this class is actually overriding the on component begin overlap. Actually, no, it's not overriding it. Um, this this on component begin overlap is specifically for this box. You can have uh, an on begin overlap. Let's spell. You can have on actor begin overlap, which will work for every component on the actor. But for obvious reasons, they want to split up which things you can interact with when. So they have this on component begin overlap, which can now get called because generate overlap events is true now. So I was uh, mistaken before, but that's fine. It's confusing code anyway. So this, the capsule is being handled here. Again, it's making sure that your the player is what it's actually touching it. Then what it does first, another example of the code being out of order. I don't know why they crisscross these, but what it's doing first is stopping that repeating from happening. So it doesn't keep saying, are you ready to move on? Uh, it stops whatever it stops that engine blasting audio cue, which I believe is looping. Uh, this one here. I think it's looping. It's pretty easy to check. Yep, it's looping. So this will just loop until you touch this capsule. So this will stop it. Then it will call CE touched in the parent. Uh, it'll disable. We'll go into this in a second. Um, it'll stop you from being able to interact with the capsule anymore. And then it will play the next part of the animation. And play some more audio cues. And once again, it is... Uh, once again, it's creating a callback for when the animation is done playing, the level sequence. And it's also disabling the glow again, since you have now interacted with the capsule. Uh, CE touched, so notice that this time trigger auto is false. What this is doing is preparing you to move on to the next sequence, but not quite doing it yet. So if you look at the CE touch code, um, it's playing around with these, uh, you know, the highlight materials, but it's set when trigger auto is false, it doesn't actually start the next interaction yet. So it's not going to move on to the next part just yet. It's just a uh, creating the animations that you want. So, uh, sequencer stage three is another variable that they're assigning in the editor. Somewhere. Oh, I'm clicking on capsule. All right, so it's in the editor here. And we can open this up and just see what it looks like. So this thing is uh, shooting. It's splitting, I guess. This is the part where they're talking about how Wait, make it smaller. I guess it's as small as you can make the level sequence. 
it's kind of frustrating given how long this is. But uh, this was the part where I think they were talking about um, like how how this part spins because it doesn't want to get burned by the sun or whatever. I don't remember. I'm not an astronaut. Uh, so yeah, once that's done playing, it re-enables the orange glow. I should write that. Enable orange. It is playing with the fade parameter again, and then it's actually fading. And remember that once again, uh, it goes when it goes through the fade process, it will eventually call fade done. And fade done is being overwritten, and it's actually up here. And this time, uh, if you remember from last time, when you set in to be false, it'll eventually lead to the parameter for fade done being backwards instead of forwards. So forward will be false, and then it will trigger the next part, which is landing. Uh, so if you click on launch pad, you can see actor to trigger is landing. So that's what we'll look at next. And just like last time, uh, there's some setup going on here, but the setup is basically the same as the Apollo logo. Uh, just like last time, there's some reset stuff that we don't need to worry about just yet because the reset hasn't happened yet. And you can see that when you hit spacebar, it will like, it'll keep moving through the process. But in AR, we don't have to worry about spacebar, so I'm not really going to spend much time explaining that. So this is probably the most complicated piece of code. I All right, I'll show I'll show my comments slowly once again. So, here is tick. I have one comment. Here is fade done. This is Apollo logo by the way. Fade done. This is early touch which I guess can only get called for Apollo logo. Then <clears throat> here's the reset part, which we didn't get to yet, but there's also interact start. Then here is the rest of this loop. And Um, my, this big blue comment is actually way too big. These other two fade things over here, are they only happen when you reset. But this obviously doesn't happen only on reset. So here are these comments. I don't think I had any other interesting comments in this class. Uh, here are the launchpad comments. So here's uh, this area. Uh, where was I going? Here's this part in the middle. Try to zoom in, I guess. I don't know if I'm allowed to publish this on GitHub because this isn't mine, it's Epic Games's. But if you look at these comments and pause on the right frames, I guess you can replicate the comments if you find them useful. So here is audio finished. Here is the interact start. Here's stage three. Here is the next part of stage three with the capsule colliding. All right, let's move on to the launch or the landing. Landing doesn't have as much code, um, but it's a bit of a weirder script. 
because it also interacts with the footprints. But begin play, it's similar to before, except now it has like this animation that plays on the lander. Let's see. So it's just kind of falling. I don't know where it went because the scale is messed up, but the lander is basically just moving. It's a pretty long animation. It's just kind of floating into nowhere. Uh, also, let me disable launch pad and enable landing. Right. Uh, so it's creating this animation. Uh, not necessarily playing it. The so let's begin play. Uh, let me try to remember what happens first. Uh, ask the trigger happens first. This is what this is what get called called by the launch pad, or by whatever the previous uh, step of the process was. So what this is doing first is making sure that from what I could tell, this was. You might have noticed in the demo video that this weird glare was always facing me. This appeared to be where that was happening. Or at least uh, setting yourself. Never mind, I guess it's just setting the entire rocket launch to be facing you. I guess I confused myself before. So never mind, this is not glare related. Uh, this is. Uh, makes landing face user so that's that's doing uh then what it's doing is it's changing which lighting setup is streaming so these ll uh scenes they actually don't have anything in them except lighting um i can show you in a bit but these are just lighting like if you open these up you'll notice that there's like it has a post-processing volume and a couple of lights and that's it but those scenes aren't doing anything else interesting. And doing streaming like this is a it's a nice trick to easily switch between light setups. Uh, but after it does that, it calls fade. And remember that this will eventually call fade done, which is this. And it swaps the floor to be the moon, I guess. And then it plays the sequence with the landing. You can check out where this is happening. Here's the landing sequence. Uh, I don't know why it's, I don't know why it moved so far, but here we go, here's the landing sequence. After it changes the surface, it looks right. Well, after it changes it to the moon, um, which is flatter, so I guess its feet will be in the right place. But anyway, it's creating this callback for when the sequence is done playing. When the sequence is done playing, then they say it plays that audio cue that says um, touch the door of the touch the door of the spacecraft. Then it enables overlap events for the box. This box is located at the door. So we can check this out quickly. This is a landing. All right, so the box is located at the door. There it is, it's this door. So it's enabling the orange glow around the door and then enabling the box overlap events. It's preparing itself, or it's it's telling the parents that I am the next thing that the player can interact with, just like we've been doing previously. And then again, it creates another one of these loops where it waits a certain amount of time and then it tells the user to touch the door. So this audio source here will have um, the please touch the door. See when you're ready to proceed. So 
The next thing we should look at is the box uh, overlap event. Oh yeah, um, I mentioned before that this is calling fade, but in this case, when fade is going forward, it doesn't do anything, so it's not really that important to us. Uh, moving on. So here's the component begin overlap for the box. You make sure that the user is touching the box. Then what you do is you, you basically play, notice that trigger auto is false. So CE touched is playing this animation like before, but it's not actually moving on to the next sequence. It plays the click sound. It makes sure that you can't touch the box anymore. And then it disables the glow. Um, and they did this in a weird uh, order where like they disabled the post process and then played the sequence and then disabled depth. So these two things are being used to play with the orange glow. And then this here is playing the next sequence, which is the astronaut walking down. And we can check that out. So it's the sequence that will play. Don't know why it keeps moving me down there, but this is the sequence where the astronaut is moving down. And then he steps on the ground and then he gets right back up there. So it creates this callback for when that's done playing. Um, but first, Notice that, again, it's stopping the looping from happening, so it doesn't keep asking you to hit the door. <clears throat> so when the astronaut's entire animation is done, then uh, the thing that makes this script a little bit weird is that it actually tells the UI footprints to show itself. So if you recall from the demo, it pops up that image of a footprint. So that's what this is doing. It's just telling that thing to animate so that it's visible and then stay there and face the user. I actually don't think that this one faces the user. I don't know if its parameters are different or something. Maybe it's not set to face the user. Yeah, so this, the UI footprints follow player is false. So this one doesn't actually look towards the user like that other text did. Uh, but it binds an event to when that animation is done playing. And here what it's doing is it's playing the interact, uh, like the you can interact sound effect again. It is enabling the orange glow again. And then it is enabling a collision. It's enabling the collision for um, the footprints box area. So you can see footprints box enable over overlap events. And uh, what they, instead of handling the overlap inside of the footprint script, so inside of UI footprints, uh, what they're doing instead is binding it inside of this class to try to make it easier and have all the code in the right place. Uh, then you can see, this is another case where they split up the orange glow related parts again. So the two depth things are here, but the post process enabling is here. Not sure why they did it in, the or in that order. Uh, then this thing is waiting for, this is waiting for stop to get called. Uh, stop is called when, stop gets called once you touch the footprints, I believe. Then it's saying that this class is what can be interacted with. And then it's say to setting some more fade parameters. So finally, uh, once you touch the, when does stop get called? Um, stop gets called down here. Yeah, so once you touch the footprints, it makes sure that the user is what's touching it. It plays the click sound, disables the glow, it makes sure that you can't touch the foot again. And then it makes the foot go away, which triggers this callback function, which uh, calls fade with the out parameter again. And remember that that means that it will go up to the overridden version of fade done, 
which in this case is just triggering the next part of the sequence, which in this case is easy because that's just the logos and stuff, the entire end sequence. So yeah, once again, we have some reset stuff, which I'll go over later once we get to the reset part. And here you can see there's more skipping to be done when you hit spacebar. But apart from that, that's more or less how this script is working. So I'll slowly go through my comments again, so you could replicate them if you want to. So here is ask to trigger. Here is the sequencer is done playing. Here is the overlap with the door. And here is the astronaut's animation being finished. And here is the footprint being touched. I guess there are more than enough places to pause when I'm explaining it earlier. So I don't even know if this is necessary. Um, the footprint doesn't really have any notable scripts that we haven't seen before. And the, except for the resetting part, which we don't have to worry about until we get into the reset part. Or, I mean, resetting is easy enough. It does what you would expect. It makes things invisible when appropriate. It sets their materials to be correct. And other setup, or more like de-setup stuff. And you can also see the functions for stop, which again, just make it not it turn invisible. So yeah, <clears throat> let's move on to the end. So uh, landing, landing's next script is, or the next part of the sequence is, uh, where is actor to trigger? The name logo. So name logo is easy enough, as we'll see in a second. It's a very simple script. So on tick, it's just making sure that the logo is always always facing you. Um, I'm not really sure why they're playing with the scale like this. It seems kind of unnecessary. I mean, they're just playing with the scale of uh, the bottom part here. I don't know why. It doesn't seem that important. <clears throat> uh, when this function gets called, which is when it comes from the landing sequence, it'll call fade, which will eventually propagate down and call fade done. At first it'll be true, and here it just delays for a second, or however much time. So it waits for five seconds, and then it calls fade again with in being false, which will be backwards, so it'll go through false, and then it will trigger the next part, which are the logos. Uh, like the Unreal and HoloLens 2 logos. So you can see, you can see that the actor to trigger is the end logo, which are those two logos, these. And this code is basically the same as the other one. So it's always facing the user. It calls fade. It waits for a couple of seconds. And then it calls fade again, and calling fade again causes it to trigger the next thing, which in this case is reset. Why does it keep moving the tab where the level is? It seems like some kind of bug in Unreal. But you can see, actor to trigger is reset, so let's move on to that. Our reset doesn't have any visuals, so there's no point in enabling it. Um, but what reset does is exactly what it sounds like it does, it just resets everything. So, first it it re resets the lighting so that it was using the uh, the launch lighting, like when you're on Earth. Then it calls AR this function AR reset on all of the interactive stuff, which now I'll go back to. Uh, that was all that code that we skipped before. Then it's resetting the UI elements, which I don't think any would be enabled at this point, but whatever. I guess this would be useful if you wanted to reset it at any point in the simulation. Uh, so it resets all the UI elements, it resets the footprint specifically, 
and it, it starts the videos from the beginning. So now we can go back quickly and see what the, fun the reset functions are doing. Uh, also, well, we'll see. Um, if, if you're wondering why this isn't calling the trigger next part of the sequence, it's because uh, that's being handled inside of Apollo, Apollo logo. So inside of Apollo logos, if I uh, reset, what it does first is uh, what it does first is prepares itself. You know, it does all this. It says, "Please touch the logo." Or no, first it's stopping the loop from happening. I don't really. Oh no, sorry, it's resetting this do once, uh, so that, so that you can touch it again. Uh, this is a so much noodle code. Anyway, uh, so it's resetting the do once node. Then it is setting the fade play rate to have uh, to do this again. Remember that this will go into the fade function, which is happening here. So this is disabling the orange glow and playing that audio cue that says, please touch the button. And then after that, it's calling this. Our reset touch is pretty much just resetting this do once loop so that you can touch it again. I guess the do once nodes in general are just used to stop you from spamming the button. And finally, it goes down to reset this other do once node. So this is just resetting a bunch of do once nodes to make sure that you can touch the button again. Inside of the next part, which was the launch pad. Where is reset? Oh, it's down here. Um, it's, it's moving you back to the earth by swapping the floor. And then it's resetting the do once node. Then it's resetting another do once node probably. Yep, it's resetting the do once note over here for when you touch the capsule. Then it is making sure the movies are not playing. I'm guessing that the stop is also resetting them. It's an internal Unreal function, so I can't see it right now. It's resetting the touchable the touchability of the actor. Not sure what UI last is doing. I never saw it being used anywhere else in the code. I'm guessing it's being used inside of their UI code, which didn't seem that interesting. So then for it's resetting the audio, then five, it is making all the other stuff. It's making all these things invisible. So yeah, then we have the landing reset, which is probably going to do basically the same thing. It's hiding itself, or it's hiding the astronaut. It is resetting the sequences. It's playing with the playing with the footprints material. What I, I well, if you recall from the demo, when the astronaut steps on the ground, it creates a footprint inside the texture. So this is probably just removing that. Parameter name Opa. That's not a very useful name. Uh, then then one is resetting this do once node. Then two is probably resetting another do once node. It's going down here and resetting this one. Then three is playing with this fade finished again. It's probably just these really high values for fade finished are probably. It's probably just like. Um, a threshold for how long you can be in the simulation doing nothing. That's my guess. I didn't really see it being used for anything interesting. After landing, we have, this is becoming a mess, the name logo. And reset probably does exactly what you would expect it to. Actually, reset's not doing anything, so that's easy enough. Same with end. Maybe they're just relying on whatever the parents' resets are. So the parent has its own version of reset. 
That's... I guess uh, whatever the other one was using was doing that too. And... Sorry, I was looking at parent. Um, I want to see if parent has any reset code. Doesn't seem to, so I guess the, the logos at the end don't need to be reset. And that's pretty much it. Uh, the Apollo re-enabled itself and all of its touchability, so that would result in the simulation being reset and showing Apollo and nothing else again after resetting all this stuff. So that's basically it, I guess. That's how this demo works. It's kind of complicated. Hopefully this helped. Uh, I confused myself quite a couple of times, but it's fine. It's 1 a.m., so it's expected. Uh, and I will also try to edit this so that it's more intelligible. So yeah, bye. Good luck with whatever you're trying to do with this demo.